ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to you this exciting new uh, area in endocrinology called the microbial endocrinology. As you can see, I have slightly changed my topic from infections in endocrinology to a broader, newer, modern, trendier topic called microbial endocrinology. And this will be my um, outline. As you can see, I'll run through viruses, the virome and the human interaction. I'll talk about how viruses sometimes code for proteins in the environment that can lead to illnesses. I'll talk about viral infections and, and particularly COVID and how endocrinology is affected by that. I'll talk about bacteria and talk about bacterium or the normal commensals giving us illnesses hormone bacterial susceptibility. And I'll talk a little bit about infections and how infections tend to be higher with certain hormones in higher concentrations. I'll talk about fungal infections, particularly hormonal aberrations, particularly uh, the ones that can happen with fungal infections. I'll talk about the other infections. There are numerous other infections that can occur in endocrine organs. I'll talk about some of the space occupying lesions that we tend to see in pituitary, adrenal, et cetera. I'll talk finally about calcium aberrations that can occur in infections in general, and then I will stop. As you can see, we have in the endotext.org, the website there in this endocrine, largest endocrine textbook in the world, I and other authors have contributed to this topic in the topic called infections and endocrinology and diabetes. And you can see a list of eight or nine topics that uh, me and other authors have contributed and it's excellent reading. And I really recommend that you go to endotext.com to look at that. So ladies and gentlemen, first I'll talk about the microbiome and how it is related to metabolic and other health. So if we look at the human microbiome, we see that there are enormous numbers of um, organisms. When you test the feces, there are more than 38 trillion bacteria in the body and 10 times that number in viruses in our microbiome and many other nematodes and others as I will show you as we go. As a comparison, you can see that there are more microbial cells in the body than our own cells, which only account for 30 trillion cells. And we have uh, more than 10 times that in a whole gamut of a variety of organisms that grow within us and on top of us um, and contribute to health and disease. And what I'm going to do is to try and see how they interact with us and create illness and health. So at the top of this diagram, you can see bacteriophages, nematodes, bacteria, and other organisms that live within us, how they interact with our own immune system. For example, dendritic cells and macrophages interact and sometimes take them in which then creates the T cell mediated immunity and then the B cell mediated immunity where is inflammatory markers going up and down. And this is an immunomodulation that occurs, usually protective, but this process, because it can activate sometimes in certain individuals who are susceptible, can lead to inflammation, which I've shown you at the right bottom corner sorry, the left bottom corner. And this can lead to insulin resistance. Sometimes polycystic ovary syndrome could be just the fault of our viruses and bacteria. Sometimes diseases like Graves and usually thyroiditis had been seen to be contributed to by the microbiome. And here in this cartoon, in this recent paper in 2020, I've shown how microbia at the bottom contribute to certain inflammatory molecules like the TMA and phosphatidylcholine, which make the atherosclerotic plaque more active and, and form cells are created leading to inflammation and rupture. So even cardiovascular disease, for example, could be contributed to by our own viral and microbial 
bacterial flora. Moving on to my second area of interest is to talk about viral mimicry, where viruses sometimes mimic certain molecules in the body and can lead to metabolic and other endocrine diseases. So on the left, you see iridovirus, and on the right, you see lymphocystis disease virus, LCDV. Both of them are known to produce insulin-like molecule, as you can see at the top, the human insulin and the human IGF, and at the bottom, the viral coded proteins that look alarmingly almost similar to human insulin or human IGF-1. And functionally, it has been shown, as you can see from this elaborate study, they almost mimic the action of human insulin and human IGF. We still haven't linked this production to things like insulin resistance or hypoglycemia or even occurrence of a tumor, for example, within the beta cell, but the search is on. In this extensive paper, the authors in, in this paper looked at 7,455 known viral genomes. These are only known viral genomes. There is a vast gamut of genomes that are not studied properly, and there are trillions of viruses in the environment. In this study, the authors asked this limited genome population or the database whether they, they can found similar molecules to the 62 human hormones adipokine system. And what they found is that a lot of these, at least 20 that are being shown here, could be coded before by viruses in the environment. And potentially, these could lead to illnesses. For example, if a virus carrying virus induced uh, protein infects a cell or a human, it can lead to inflammation and lead to paracrine endocrine signaling that can lead, for example, if it is pancreas, it can lead to insulin resistance, it can lead to hypoglycemia or even a tumor formation as a potential mechanism. And that paper in endocrinology 2019 uh, has been summarized in this cartoon by me. Moving on to hormones and susceptibility to illnesses, we know that men are more vulnerable to, for example, influenza or COVID than women. Um, estrogen tends to be protective. Uh, in this cartoon, you can see that as time, as women become menopause, the normal bacterial uh, flora gets replaced by other abnormal organisms like the Gardnerella vag vaginalis, Neisseria gonerea, and other viruses that can lead to infections. Estrogen has a protective action and lack of estrogen leads to abnormal atrophic vaginal flora and lack of estrogen leads to lack of protection for the woman and leads to vaginitis, which can sometimes be treated by estrogen topically. And the first question that I asked, why do men more, are more susceptible? Why are women tended to be protected against uh, viral illnesses like in viral uh, respiratory illnesses, for example? You can see at the bottom, the blue, the men ha ha do have, as under the influence of androgen receptor signaling, uh, inflammatory markers like uh, protective markers, but women on top in the pink have it in more augmented form. So when there is estrogen signaling on the estrogen receptors, all these viral and bacterial protective mechanisms within our body are, are overactivated. That is one of the reasons why women get more connective tissue diseases and autoimmune conditions, but it also explains to us why men are more susceptible than women or why women are more protected from other infections. So ladies and gentlemen, COVID and endocrine system are interlinked and an important and an interesting topic. We reviewed this topic in two years ago as the pandemic emerged. And what is shocking is to see that the body itself codes for more than 100 viruses, 
in our co in our genomes. ACE receptor is one of them. The organism COVID SARS-CoV-2 latches onto that with the SARS ACE viral receptor or the ACE receptor is a ubiquitous one, which is found all around the body, including notably in many endocrine organs like pancreas, the pituitary, the thyroid, and so on. So this ubiquity leads to potential infection by the ACE uh, through the ACE by the COVID organism, the SARS-CoV-2, to lead to potentially devastating consequences in most of the endocrine organs. So we, we have reviewed in our paper how hypothalamic pituitary axis can be affected by direct hypothalamic effect, by causation of a hypophysitis, or sometimes the organism can mimic ACTH and can lead to autoimmune attack on the ACTH. Uh, effects on the adrenal gland uh, could be adrenalitis. And it's important in post-COVID syndromes to look for these problems, the pituitary and adrenal, as an explanation of long COVID unexplained wake symptoms in patients. But more importantly, in the acute COVID, Patients could have critical illness-related adrenal insufficiency, which means that the cortisol they produce is not adequate, either due to fresh attack by adrenalitis or pituitary ACTH deficiency, or by relative deficiency due to previous existing. And how to treat it is, is something that we need to learn, and I've just given an outline in that slide. Various types of thyroid diseases have been reported in literature subsequently. We have seen thyroiditis as part of severe COVID illness. Patients could have central hypothyroidism from pituitary disease, as I've explained before. Patients could have primary hypothyroidism resulting from infection. And also more clearly on the left side, CQ thyroid syndrome is something that we see in all critical illnesses. Pancreas and COVID are, are almost very well known by everyone. The pancreas could be affected by viral direct injury through the ACE expressing beta cells. You could have hyperglycemia due to fresh infection itself and the severity of the infection. There could be pancreatitis and resulting in almost like a type one syndrome in patients which had been well reported throughout and severe hyperglycemia at presentation had been shown to be a known risk factor for poorer performance as a patient with COVID. Vitamin D and COVID are almost uh, interlinked. As you can see in this cartoon, vitamin D is necessary for cellular mediated immunity, even for the ACE RAS system to function normally. And vitamin deficiency can be one debilitating factor for patients' defense mechanisms when they are infected, not just with COVID, but for other infections as well. In the remaining few minutes, I am going to talk about bacteria and endocrine system. Uh, in this elegant study, the authors back 20 years back showed that when epinephrine is added to in vitro E. coli culture, and for that matter, many gram-negative organisms tended to grow floridly when epinephrine or some of the organisms would grow floridly with dopamine, et cetera. Remembering that these are stress hormones which are elevated in critically ill patients. This is one of the explanations why patients are more susceptible to secondary gram-negative infections, particularly when they are unwell. And here we see how bacteria relate to the epinephrine and no epinephrine and can cause more severe infection. One by previous adaptation to the epinephrine and no epinephrine, which make them grow more, uh, more floridly, but also locally effects uh, can lead to severe infection. And so that's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, an interesting concept that we have seen. Uh, other microbial and endocrine system also is important and interesting. For example, in the adrenal on the left side, uh, we've seen, we, I have shown you a bilateral adrenal mass, which is uh, hypo-intense than the liver here. Um, so it's uh, 
It is due to histoplasma infection, which usually occurs in immunosuppressed people and requires long-term antibiotic therapy specific for histoplasma. On the right, we see ring enhancement of the lesion with hypointensity in the middle, asymmetric bilateral lesions, as you can see. This is typical of TB adrenalitis, which can present subsequently with adrenal insufficiency due to destruction of the adrenal uh, cortex by the tuberculous organisms. Talking about TB, this is something that occasionally we will see a ring hence enhancing lesion, hypo intense of the pituitary, which is due to tuberculosis of the pituitary. We have known that certain conditions which cause granulomatous disease like sarcoidosis can lead to hypercalcemia through increasing of the 1-alpha hydroxylation of the 25-hydroxy-D3, which leads to relatively high 125-hydroxy-D3. And this is caused by the interferon production from the granuloma. Now we also know that tuberculosis and other fungal infections like histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, cryptococcosis, and pneumocystis carinae, which can give you granulomatous disease can also give hypercalcemia. The, the hallmark is that there is high 125 hydroxy D3 with the relatively lower or normal 25 hydroxy D3. So ladies and gentlemen, I've taken you through this vast and interesting topic, which covers from virus to other infections. So in interesting conditions, susceptibility, and, and even potentially new potential relationships that we will see in terms of virome or the bacterium and disease causation. And once again, let me thank the ICE, the AOCE and the AFIS for having invited me and having partnered with SAFIS in this event. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.